Okay, welcome back. We're going to talk about muscle design. The two fundamental properties that we've already learned help us to understand a lot. The first is the length tension curve, where the maximal force of a muscle fiber is at about resting length, or a little bit longer than resting length. And that's thought to have to do with the structure of actin and myosin where we have the greatest degree of overlap for the cross bridges. The other property is the force velocity relationship, where the greatest force occurs at the lowest velocity, and that's a decreasing function, force is a decreasing function of velocity, um, and the highest velocity can be achieved at the lowest forces. And that's thought to be a result of the fact that the myosin heads move as the muscle shortens. Okay, and if you want uh, more of a review of this, there's a really excellent short web page here that you can go to from UCSD. Okay, and it has a brief uh, overview of that. In order to move, animals often have to generate power. Power is work over time, or the rate of producing work. And remember, work is force times the change in length, or force times distance. Power is also force times velocity. So you can think of this as the force of the muscle times the velocity of shortening. And power is important for jumping, flying, accelerating, like when you start to run from a standstill. Let's talk about power. It comes from the force velocity curve right here. So you notice that this is a graph of relative force on the y-axis and relative velocity, v over v max on the x-axis. And you get peak power right here, which happens to be at intermediate velocity and intermediate force. That's because when force is really high, of course, velocity is near zero, so power is near zero. When velocity is really high, force is near zero, so power, again, is near zero. Power peaks right here in the intermediate range in intermediate velocity and intermediate force. Right, so the ratio of the velocity relative to the maximal velocity, v over v max, is important. And velocity is proportional to the number of sarcomeres in series, right? That chain of sarcomeres, like how long is your chain? And force is proportional to the number of cross bridges in parallel, like how many muscle fibers do you have in that cross-sectional area? So it's proportional to cross-sectional area. So when we think about muscle and fiber design, we have to take into account power, speed, and energetics because a wide variety of motor tasks are required by muscle. Sometimes you need high speed. Sometimes you need powerful contractions. Sometimes you need repetitive sustained contractions. Or sometimes you need forceful sustained contraction that maybe don't have to require as much shortening. So by Tweaking the traits and the design of fibers or muscle, a muscle can be specialized for a specific function. The energetics, of course, are the cost, and so that's really important because faster contracting muscles use ATP faster because every time you're going to move that myosin head and attach it to another one, it requires an ATP. So let's talk about muscle architecture the physical arrangement of muscles and muscle fibers. These are some of the basic shapes that we have. Strap muscles are long and have long muscle fibers, and they just go from origin to insertion. Fusiform have this belly shape, and it's usually a muscle that's attached to a tendon. Unipinnate have a tendon that the muscle fiber is attached to at an angle. So it kind of looks like half of a feather. And then finally, we have bipinnate, which is basically a sy symmetrical attachment like a feather, like this. So these muscle architectures are going to have different behavior 
with regard to force and speed, right? Because force production is proportional to the number of cross bridges involved. And so long strap muscles tend to not be very, have very much cross-sectional area. So they have low force, but this muscle is going to be high speed because there's so many sarcomeres in series that once it contracts, it will shorten by a lot. On the other end of the spectrum is the bipinnate, where you see that these fibers are very short. And actually, um, the, this muscle is not going to shorten very much. But it, it can generate high force because there's a lot of sarcomeres in this cross-sectional area. If you cut across here, you'll cut across many, many um, cross bridges. And this is typical of like the gastroc in, in the ankle of a vertebrate. And so you try, you, the shortening is not very much, but also it stores energy in this tendon. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Strap muscles have a lot of sarcomeres in series, but they don't tend to have a lot of cross-sectional area. They tend to be really thin muscles. So they can shorten a lot or ha result in a fast movement but not produce a lot of force. In contrast, the bipinnate has very short muscle fibers. So this muscle is not actually going to contract by a lot, but it can generate high force because there's more cross bridges per cross sectional area of the muscle. So it's low speed, but high force. And we can use this to understand the behavior of the biceps and its antagonist, the triceps. So the triceps has three heads. It originates in the forearm, but it attaches to the lower humerus, the upper humerus, and the scapula, which are thought to allow the, the forearm to be stabilized through a range of motion uh, because they have different gear ratios. So, when you need to move your arm quickly, like when you're swinging your arms because you're running or something, you might activate or recruit um, the, this long head because it has long muscle fibers and it's going to be able to shorten quickly. Um, and so that's going to be an architecture optimized for speed over force. On the other hand, if you're carrying your groceries or something, and you just need to exert force without much shortening, you might recruit this lower one because it has fibers at an angle. This muscle is not very long, it's short in fact, but it has all of these fibers at an angle so that it can um, produce, have actually a big cross-sectional area used to stabilize force without much shortening. So that's gonna be optimized for force. So even though the lever arms aren't that different for these muscles, they are a little bit. Um, what, what's really going on is this ratio, anatomical gear ratio difference. And that's the ratio of velocity of the whole muscle versus the muscle fiber velocity. So in this one, the whole muscle shortens a lot relative to the fiber, whereas this one, the whole muscle shortens little relative to the fiber velocity. So the gear ratio is just this concept like it's the inverse of mechanical advantage. I called gear ratio distance advantage, um, how much it moves, but it's the same that applies to velocity. Um, and mechanical advantage, I called force advantage. This is like in your car where high gear is good for when you're driving down the freeway at fast speed, but you don't need a lot of torque. You don't need a lot of force because you're already going at fast speed. Low gear is what you use when you need to climb up a hill, especially if you have a load. So you can't go very fast. It's going to happen at low speed, but you can exert a huge amount of torque or high force. So this is a pretty ingenious design allowing for this, you know, antagonistic pair of muscles to stabilize the arm over a huge range of activities. We have lots of muscles. So of course, real muscles are 
much more complicated than the ideal. <laughs> and so those ideal shapes like the bipinnate um, are, are ideal and strap muscles are, are an idealization. Like real muscles are a little more murky than that, but the best example or one of the most famous is the, of bipinnate is the gastroc or calf muscle. It has a bipinnate structure with short muscle fibers at an angle, and it's attached to this long tendon. Muscles used in running tend to have this type of, um, or jumping tend to have this type of architecture because of course, when your foot lands on the ground, as your foot lands on the ground, the bend of the ankle is gonna stretch this Achilles tendon. So the weight of your mass bearing down on stretching the tendon is going to basically load the spring so that when you take off again, you can release that spring and recover some of that energy for free, basically. Um, the tibialis, on the front here is a good example of a parallel fiber muscle, and it's the ankle flexor, whereas the gastroc is the ankle extensor. Here's another example of muscles. So um, I know a lot of you guys have predators, and this is a dog. This is from Miller's Anatomy of the Dog, which is an amazing book. Um, so here's the skull of the dog. It's a predator, as you know. So this is the large temporalis muscle. It's huge. And this is like this huge fossa here for muscle insertion. And it attaches to the jaw. So it's involved in jaw closing. This, of course, when the jaw closes, the force is applied here on the canines. So there's a long lever arm here with this huge muscle um, in contrast the masseter is involved in grinding okay and this like cheek muscle here exerts force on the molars and so it uses it, it can actually cause the molars to grind or or slash or whatever um, it, it tends to be really enlarged in herbivores, but a little bit smaller in predators. So this, um, relatively speaking, the masseter has a shorter lever arm out. Okay, and then you can also look at the um, cross-sectional area. So here's the masseter in a predator. Um, and the temporalis is much, much bigger. Okay, so these are really interesting, and you can use this to actually model bite force in your animal um, or grinding forces in your bite force in your predator and grinding forces in your herbivore. And if you want to blow your mind even further, because biology is so beautiful, there's even variable gearing. David Carrier and his colleagues did this really beautiful, elegant experiment where they looked at running human feet during running, okay? And they argued that their design is such that there's actually a way to change the gear ratio of the ankle extensor during the running step. So um, if you look at this, what they have here, oops, is, um, this is the in force and the in lever and the out force and the out lever here. So they have this um, gear ratio, which is uh, the out lever over the in right here. And you can see that during the running step, it changes. So at the beginning during landing, the um, in lever is large and the out lever is very small. And that allows for stretching of the tendon. Uh, during mid-step, it's more equal. And then at the end, the out lever arm is huge, right at the time when um, speed is increasing and this muscle shortening is happening. So what happens is we start with a low gear ratio. And as, as you take off again, 
you have you're operating now at high gear from low gear to high gear which allows for the muscle tendon velocity to be optimized so that you can have enhanced muscle performance by applying a more effective pre-stretch during the landing phase here while maintaining muscles near the high power portion of the force velocity curve during takeoff. Isn't that awesome? And many ACZ and colleagues actually discovered that pennate muscles have variable gearing, which just blew my mind. So if you remember the pennate muscle, it has all these short fibers at an angle. And they, they realized that as these muscle fibers contract, there's two possibilities. Either the pinnation angle remains the same, or the muscle fibers could actually perhaps rotate so that the angle of pinnation is changing. Okay, and so they looked at anatomical gear ratio under these two possibilities and looked for two things. In the first, so this is the relaxed state, and then this is one contracted state where you see the pinnation angle changes. And so at a, um, and the thickness of the muscle increases, resulting in more rotation. And so the whole, the muscle itself actually is shortening far more, which will result in a higher anatomical gear ratio and higher speed. In the second possibility, if you preserve the angle, you have, uh, it's actually getting thinner, but there's no rotation and there's much smaller muscle shortening. So this is a low anatomical gear ratio and more force produced. So they, what they found was that this, this is the part that really blew my mind. Okay, the magnitude of the fiber rotation and therefore the gear ratio depended on how the muscle changes shape. Okay, and it's not fixed, but it actually decreases with the force. So it's dynamic. And actually this change promotes fiber rotation at low forces and resists fiber rotation at high forces. So this variable gearing automatically adjusts to the load to favor velocity output during low load contractions and force output for contractions against high loads. Isn't that amazing? This is actually an automatic transit transmission system allowing pennate muscles to shift from high gear during rapid contractions to low gear during forceful contractions. And that, folks, just blew my mind. Hope you have a great day. Take care.